Hello and welcome to the podcast shedding candlelight on cryptids, hauntings, mythology, and more. If it is weird, we are talking about it. This is your host, Lee Donna. I am a thriller and suspense author with some fantasy thrillers coming soon, which is the entire reason for this podcast. As Stephen King said, fiction is the truth within the lie. So while I'm gathering the truth and mixing it into my smoldering pots of lies, I'll be documenting my research and sharing that with you. The show notes will include all the sources I use while putting together said research, starting with today's episode topic, that part of Irish folklore known as the leprechaun. Now, I know I just told you that I'm starting this podcast as a direct result of my writing. However, leprechauns have nothing to do with anything. They just randomly popped into my head one day, which is fine. I'm perpetually distracted, so random things fluttering through my head are no big deal. Until I decide said random thought would be a great idea to kick off my podcast with, I mean... Leprechauns are easy, right? They're simple. We all know what they are. We've seen those cereal boxes. We even misappropriated the death of a saint just so we could collar shamrocks and celebrate leprechauns. Well, folks, I hate to break it to you, but by the end of this podcast, you're going to be as confused as I am as to what a leprechaun even is. Because when I started this fun little research dive, I wasn't confused at all. Now, I am questioning everything. So here is my one and only disclaimer. If you are taking an exam that covers leprechauns, are getting a degree in mythology that encompasses any of the lore I'll talk about on today's episode, or are currently dealing with an active leprechaun infestation, This episode of Immortal Monsters will not help you. It's quite possible that everything you hear today will be a lie. Now, as I said, and probably truthfully, the infamous being known as the Leprechaun comes from Irish mythology. Irish mythology is a branch of Celtic or Celtic mythology. Think of this as being structured the same way as how different denominations of most modern religions are all branches of Christianity. Irish mythology is also the most well-preserved of the Celtic mythologies, but the leprechaun is one of their newest members of lore, which could be why things are contradictory with them. It certainly seems to be why there's really not a lot of information out there specifically about leprechauns. The lore is more full of terms that are used to describe groups of beings. Therefore, interpretations are left up to perspective and belief structures. The confusion with leprechauns starts right at the beginning. We are talking about the very origin of the word leprechaun being debatable. So before we get lost in what the creature itself may or may not be, Let's talk about where his name came from. Some stories of old suggest that the name originated beyond the shores of Airy. Airy being the modern Irish language name for Ireland, which is derived from Eru, a goddess described as the matron goddess of ancient Irish mythology. Did you like those mispronunciations? If so, hold on to your hats, boys and girls, because here we go with a whole bunch more. Forms of the word leprechaun were not used until the late 17th century, such as in text like Decker's The New Whore. Quote, as for your Irish lubricon, that spirit whom by preposterous charms thy lust has raised, unquote. It appears that the word leprechaun comes from the Irish leprechaun or leprechaun, which comes from the Middle Irish leprechaun, leprechaun, which is originally from the Old Irish leprechaun, meaning small body. Now, small body people in Ulster are known as pecked or Also in Ulster, pecked 
is a generic name for Aboriginal Scottish people, and in some cases, it's used as a derogatory term. Now, I don't know how tall Aboriginal Scottish people are. I did try to look this up, but couldn't find anything definitive. So as we move forward, just keep in mind that even though today we think of Scotsmen as being fairly tall, there is a derogatory term attached to Aboriginal Scottish people that means small body. While digging into this leprechaun name situation, I did see a good amount of discussion about the lore of the wee folk coming from explorers, trade routes, conquerors, people encountering small races of solitary dwellers all outside of Ireland. As is common in human nature, people have fear of the unknown, so it's entirely possible that travelers brought back these tales of wee folk in the woods and those not-so-tall tales contributed to the fairy stereotypes that now permeate Irish folklore. Before we get into that folklore, let's do a little more history, but only because I'd like you to actually hear some things that have a higher probability of being true than anything else that I'm going to tell you today about leprechauns. The Scots are a nation and ethnic group native to Scotland. Historically, they emerged in the Middle Ages from a mixture of two Celtic-speaking peoples, the Picts and the Gaels. The Scots tend to have blue eyes and pale skin, sometimes with freckles, and for the most part, they have light brown or red hair. This uniqueness in their appearance sets them apart, and some people consider them very elegant and aristocratic. Keeping this in mind, let's remember that stories abound about the origins of the very name of the being portrayed as Ireland's national mascot, and the tales about their size and clothing are just as full of inconsistencies. In general, what we see on St. Patrick's Day, at least here in the United States, is a wee man with red hair and tidy green clothes with pots of gold at his disposal. In reality, according to the lore I dug up, the leprechaun is quite untidy. He's often disheveled with dirty clothes that are either a dingy green or a blue coat with red pants, a filthy shirt tucked haphazardly into his trousers, wool stockings, worn shoes, and whatever type of hat he's wearing, it's usually askew. Sometimes they wear a rudimentary red stocking cap that they apparently made themselves, and this cap is described as not well done because they aren't good with needle and thread. This is one of those particular contradictions that stood out because we'll learn later that the leprechaun is also known as a noteworthy cobbler. So to say he can't sew a hat, but that he can make a fantastic pair of shoes It just seems odd to me. But no matter if he's tidy or not, the leprechaun's manner of dress is described as that of what the aristocracy would have worn during the time the leprechaun lore started in Ireland. And he is also found in the lore of Scotland, the north of England, as well as other places. Folklore says the leprechaun's boots have heels built into them because he is sensitive about his size. So how tall is he? This should be a really simple question to answer, but like most things with the leprechaun, it is not because the leprechaun's size depends on where he lives. If he is outside in a ditch or under a bush, he can be as small as a thumbnail. So I measured my thumbnail and it is three quarters of an inch. So no wonder we can't find these lucky leprechauns with their pots of gold. However, if the leprechaun is living in a cave or an abandoned building, he's as tall as a two-year-old child. So now we're talking he's two to three foot tall, and those we should be able to catch. But my favorite and the most remarkable part of the lore is the part that says leprechauns were once as tall as normal-sized humans. Now, I'm not sure what constitutes a normal-sized human. In my home, I'm 5'4", my husband is 5'10", our son is 6'2", and my brand new daughter-in-law, who, by the way, just found out that she loves all things fairy, she is maybe just a little touch shorter than me. 
So my question is, leprechauns were as tall as which normal-sized humans? Yates says the Tuatha de Danann were gods and followers of the gods of pagan Ireland. When they were no longer worshipped, they became small in size. Now, we are going to talk about the Tuatha de Danann a little later, but for now, just know that they are a group of collective beings that are probably fairies and may or may not include the leprechauns. And told you this show is going to be light on the facts, guys. Okay, so going back to how Yates described the Tuatha de Danann, some people, maybe those who do lump the leprechaun into the Tuatha de Danann, believe leprechauns used to be gods and that when they were worshipped as such, they were as tall as normal humans. Then people stopped believing in them and they shrank. This belief makes me think leprechauns are kind of like a tulpa then, because a tulpa is an entity created in the mind, but able to act independently of the consciousness that created it. They're sentient, able to think, have their own free will, emotions, memories, and it is said that the tulpas were discovered when ancient humans started meditating. Now, some people say, no, 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 no. Leprechauns were never gods. They were angels. Angels who refused to choose a side in the battle between God and Lucifer. Therefore, they were deemed unworthy of staying in heaven, but yet not wicked enough to be cast into hell. So what do you do with those types of angels? You send them to earth. This means leprechauns are fallen angels. Maybe they are, maybe they are not, but wherever they come from and whatever they are, and regardless of their ability to hide under a bush or grow in size, when we, the people, start believing in them, once again, in Irish mythology, the leprechaun does fall under the topic of the fairy folk, also known as the wee folk or the little people. Collectively, they are referred to as sheed or sheedy, meaning dwellers of the mounds. Sheed being the mounds, the peaceful places, these are the burial mounds, maybe. What I pronounce as sheedy is spelled S-I-D-H-E, and sheed is S-I-D. Now, in some places, I only saw sheedy, S-I-D-H-E, which is listed and referred to as the mound with a different term that I'll mention later than referring to the fairy folk themselves. Also, when I've seen S-I-D-H-E referring to the mound and not the people of the mound, they also pronounce it the same way that I heard the S-I-D sheed pronounced. So remember my disclaimer from earlier and choose your own adventure. Thank you and you are welcome. Now, these peaceful sheed places were dubbed portals to the Celtic Otherworld, by the Gaels who arrived in Ireland between 500 and 300 BCE. We remember that the Gaels were part of the amalgamation that made the Scots. The other world is known as Tirnanag, the land of the gods. Now, the Sheed or Sheedy are a study all into themselves. It seems to me that some scholars lump huge chunks of mythological creatures, if not all of them, under the umbrella of Sheed, while others exclude certain creatures such as the leprechaun. Trying to figure out who is right on this particular point is beyond me, but lumping creatures together like this is akin to calling all the people to concert humans. They have different heights, weights, body shapes, abilities, yet they are all in fact humans. So depending on what you think the leprechaun is, it's possible to include them under the umbrella of the sheet or sheety. I sit here before you today with absolutely no idea. I will give you my conclusions on what I do think about the leprechauns at the end of this episode with my apologies in advance to the whole of Ireland. 
This would also be a good time for me to mention that I do have Irish blood running through my veins. So I too am a descendant of the leprechaun. It's why I have such a soft, tiny voice that requires me to stay on top of this microphone. If I don't have this so close, then I have to record the same video 397 times because not even I can hear myself on the recordings. So back to the lore of my ancestors. Leprechauns are also known as members of the Tawatha Day Danan. Tawatha Day being the tribe of the gods and translating to the followers of Danu. Now, Danu is the earth mother goddess, and she was honored under various names from Eastern Europe to Ireland. And according to Britannica.com, the mythology surrounding her is contradictory and confused. Hmm. Imagine that. It does appear that if Danu and Eru are not the same, that Eru falls under Danu's reign or realm or whatever it's called. I don't really know the proper term, but there's a pretty good article about Danu on mythologysource.com. So you can check that out if you want to know about the Earth Mother Goddess. The leprechaun is known to inhabit Ireland before the arrival of the Celts. Some consider leprechauns to be the true natives of Ireland who are descended from Irish royalty. They were the aristocracy. So this means leprechauns are itty bitty shrinking royal fairies with a splash of a god complex and a set of angel wings. <laughs> Here is the potentially true story of how they came to occupy Ireland. Many thousands of years ago, on a cold and starlit night in the land of the day Danan, the ground began to shift. While the leprechauns struggled to stay on their feet, the mountains spat fire and the seas rose, spitting mud from their now boiling waters. Sure, they had angered the Lady Danu, but not knowing how, the leprechauns had no choice but to flee their land. Amid the tempest that would surely destroy their island, they loaded huge metal ships with goods and tools, grain, dried meat, hard bread, healing herbs, seeds of rare trees, and ancient books. Then they sailed away from the isle just in time. On the morning of the fifth day, Niall, who some say was the oldest creature in the world, that he had walked the earth in the time of dinosaurs, he called his two sons together. Now, Niall was the tallest of the small folk with a straight back, hair and beard white as snow, and a face full of wrinkles. His two sons were half-brothers and looked nothing alike. Gila's mother had been from the Fur Derg tribe, the Red Folk tribe, and he was small and red-faced with a large bulbous nose and a mass of red hair. His clothing was red and bronze, and he had a fierce temper. Seamus Ban's mother was from the Leprechaun tribe, which made Seamus a full-blooded leprechaun. He was tall and thin with coal black hair, but he was the second son. Thus, his father decided to set the two already at odds brothers against each other by giving them a task of skill and cunning that would determine which brother would become the new king of the leprechauns. All they had to do was find a new, fresh green land for their people. For days, the brothers poured through books and charts, looking for clues as to where a new land could be found. Frustrated and pondering whether or not they were doomed to sell off the edge of the earth, Seamus went to the deck of the ship and stood by the dragon figurehead, looking out into the fog that had surrounded them since the day they left day to nine. That's when he saw the bird. And being a smart lad, Seamus knew that a bird meant land was nearby. He shouted and his father instructed that they follow that bird. Thus, Seamus became king of the leprechauns and the little people arrived in Ireland. The Tuatha Dé Danann landed at the Connaught coastline and emerged from a great mist. It's speculated that they burned their boats to ensure that they settled down in their new land. 
Now, I've contemplated why a group of people would do something like this, and it doesn't make a lot of sense. How do you know you're going to like the new land? And what if the people already inhabiting said land are hostile? So the only reason I could think that they would burn their boats would be if there's a power struggle still happening. Maybe Gila was trying to convince the leprechauns to follow him. So Seamus, making sure that this couldn't happen, had all of their boats burned. But also... The first part of that story says that their ships were metal, so also choosing to burn them just seems like an odd choice. Now, I'm going to tell you what happened after the leprechauns went ashore, but please note that the above story and the second half are not written together as one text. In fact, Seamus, Gila, and good old Niall, who I think could possibly be Methuselah, are never mentioned again, nor is the name Leprechaun specifically, only the Tuatha de Danan. But if Leprechauns are Tuatha de Danan, which seems to be the case considering the lore I just read to you, then this second half is referring to the Leprechauns. With two grains of salt, here we go. The rulers of Ireland at the time when the leprechauns landed on their shores were the Fir Bolg led by Eogod, son of Urk, who was, needless to say, unhappy about the new arrivals. The Tuatha de Danann won the inevitable battle with the Fir Bolg, but out of respect for the manner in which the Fir Bolg had fought, the Tuatha de Danann allowed the Firbolg to remain in Connaught while the victors ruled the rest of Ireland. The manuscript, The Annals of the Four Masters, records that they ruled Ireland from 1897 BC to 1700 BC. These new rulers of Ireland were a civilized and cultured people. The new skills and traditions that they introduced into Ireland were held in high regard by the people they conquered. They had four great treasures or talismans that demonstrated their skill. The first was the Stone of Fall, which would scream when a true king of Ireland stood on it. It was later placed on the hill of Tara, the seat of the High Kings of Ireland. The second talisman was the Magic Sword of Nuada, which was capable of inflicting only mortal blows. The third treasure was the slingshot of the sun god Lug, famed for its accuracy when used. The final treasure was the cauldron of Dagda, from which an endless supply of food issued. The original leader of the Tuatha was Nuada, but having lost his arm in battle, it was decreed that he could not rightly be king. No equal opportunities in those days, and that prejudice is why the Tuatha de Danann were defeated by the Milesians and consigned to mythology. A legend has it that they were allowed to stay in Ireland, much like the kindness shown to the Fir Bulg, but the Tuatha de Danann were only allowed to be underground. Thus, they became the bearers of the fairies of Ireland consigned to the underworld where they became known as Ashidi or Ashid, the people of the mound. Apparently, the Milesians were the ones who named Ireland and they did so after the Tuatha de Danann god Eru. To recap where we are so far, the leprechauns fled their land due to a natural disaster that they may or may not have been responsible for, landed in Ireland, ruled for a while, got conquered, and now the lore of the little people begins. Leprechauns are not usually the subject of myth themselves, but rather the supporting characters. They're not the heroes, but the helpers or hindrances to the hero, mostly hindrances because they are misers and extremely selfish, which brings us to their gold. Leprechauns became associated with gold through a story dating back to the Danes' invasion of Ireland. Legend states that the Danes left the leprechauns in charge of their plundered wealth, 
which the little men put into crocks and pots and hid throughout Ireland. Leprechauns carry two pouches. One holds a silver shilling, a magical coin that returns to the pouch each time it is paid out. This reminds me a little bit of the Cauldron of Dogda mentioned earlier. The other pouch holds a single coin, which the leprechaun uses to extract himself from difficult situations. Once this gold coin has been paid out, it usually turns to leaves or ash. This is the purse of the shilling lure, or as I cannot pronounce it, the Sparan no Schling. So we're just going to call it the purse of the shilling lure. Not only will that gold coin turn to leaves or ash, but the person receiving the coin becomes a drunk and or a gambler. Their life is left in ruin and their wealth turned to dust, kind of like when people win the modern day lottery. Now, a leprechaun will reveal the location of his gold if questioned, but the person doing the questioning must keep an eye on the leprechaun. If you look away, even for an instant, they will vanish because, newsflash, leprechauns are invisible. So good luck catching one. I'm not even sure why I wasted so much time talking about how tall they are when we can't even see them. But there are ways for us to tell when a leprechaun is around. Apparently, if you see a small whirlwind or dust cloud, it's a leprechaun or a different type of fairy because they all have the ability to be invisible whenever they feel like it. So what do you do if you see this dust cloud? Well, old men tip their hats to these dust clouds and old ladies curtsy because whether you believe or not, it's better to show respect than to be on the bad end of a fairy. In some areas, people even bend the knee and say, God bless me. Others throw their left shoe at the fairy, not the right shoe, only the left. Why? Because if you throw your left shoe at the leprechaun, it will have no choice but to drop whatever it's carrying and what the leprechaun is carrying just might be gold. It could also be a child because in addition to being invisible, hiding under bushes and traveling in dust clouds, leprechauns also have a habit of stealing babies. That's right. You heard me. They steal babies and carry them off to be sold at one of the mounds where the kids grow up being servants to the fairies. Or they get carted into the other world to be used in whatever way the mythical creatures residing there want to use them. It's terrible, and I'm sorry. I really thought leprechauns were just sweet little sprites. A little mischievous, but you know what? Who isn't? Alas... They are not sweet at all. Leprechauns are baby snatchers. You can protect your kids, though. All you have to do is get a clergyman to baptize your child whenever they are born. If there isn't a clergyman handy, a midwife can do a temporary baptism, and that will hold until the baby can be taken to the clergy. What? No clergy or midwife? Never fear. All you have to do in that case is cover the baby with dad's coat or a different article of his clothing. Basically, just keep the kid covered up by dad's clothes because this signals to the fairies that the infant has been claimed by the human world because in leprechaun speak, being an actual human doesn't mean we claim you. Only swaddling the baby in dad's clothing shows the fairy world that your baby is loved and accepted by the humans. Having said that, I should probably mention that the interim baptism that the midwife does, it only actually protects the baby from a specific type of leprechaun-like creature called a taran, not from the leprechauns themselves. So you are going to need a clergyman if you want your child to remain in your care instead of being fodder for the fairies and the creatures of the underworld. Also, the clergyman's baptism is only good during infancy. 
After that, once your child makes it to the age where he or she can talk, the leprechaun is going to come for them again. You see, if the leprechaun addresses your child directly or the child addresses them and a question is answered, bam, leprechaun snatched and your child is on their way to being sold at the fairy market. Such a cheery story, but you know what? The leprechaun is an equal opportunity creature, being, fairy, god, tulpa, whatever he is. So children aren't the only ones in danger. Leprechauns are vindictive and they will take revenge on anyone they think has wronged them. Mind you, a wrong didn't really have to occur. You could be blissfully unaware that you did anything offensive. Maybe you just forgot to curtsy or tip your hat when you were passing by that invisible creature. How dare you? Because he is keeping track and making a list of who's naughty so he does not have to be nice. Knowing how malicious leprechauns can be, homeowners, to keep the wee man from wreaking havoc on them, used to, and some surely still do, put gifts out for the leprechaun. They leave these gifts on their doorsteps and the gifts include items like milk, cheese, water, tobacco, and liquor. Not too much alcohol though, or the leprechaun is going to get sloshed and raise all kinds of cane. So if you do put out liquor, make sure you are the first house in the row of houses that the leprechaun is going to hit that night. Also, be aware that the teenagers in your life they aren't actually seeing leprechauns. They just want alcohol and they are using this lure to their advantage. Now, to be fair, not to the teens, but to the leprechauns, some say that it isn't the leprechaun that causes the problems. It is his cousin who gets drunk and causes the chaos during the night. Who knows? All we can say for sure is that leprechauns like poteen. Poteen is a distilled Irish drink made from grain, sugar beets, potatoes. It sounds like it's pretty much basically moonshine. And it said that the leprechaun will not share his drink. But honestly, who's asking? I'm not sure it's safe to even look a dust cloud in the eye. So who in their right mind is trying to go out and have a drink with the leprechaun? He's not only mean, he is a trickster. It's said that anyone who finds his pot of gold and can trick it away from him gets to keep the leprechaun's gold. However, among other things, the leprechaun is very clever. So it's usually the silly human trying to outwit him who ends up tricked and without a stitch of gold to be found. It is also said that you will hear a leprechaun before you ever see one, which makes complete sense because they are invisible. Anyway, if you are ever out in the rural countryside and you hear, it's usually the sound of a leprechaun hammering nails into the soles of a shoe, as happened to one brave lad who heard the tapping and went off in search of the leprechaun. He found the wee man and demanded gold, so the leprechaun showed him a tree and told him the gold is there. Dig it up. The boy didn't have a shovel, and he was scared to leave the leprechaun alone. He knew the creature was going to try to trick him, so he tied a ribbon around the tree and made the wee man promise to leave the ribbon on the tree. The leprechaun was caught fair and square, so he made the promise, and the boy ran home to fetch his shovel. When he came back to claim his gold, he saw that the leprechaun did in fact keep his promise. You see, the boy's ribbon was still on the tree. He just couldn't tell which tree had his particular ribbon on it because the leprechaun had tied identical ribbons on every tree in the woods. Now, about this tap, tap, tapping from the creature who can't sew a hat, but who can make a shoe. The leprechaun is known as the fairy shoemaker. The Oxford English Dictionary lists one possible origin of shoemaker as leaf brogan. Just a bit of useless information I thought I would throw into this episode because why not? Traditional portraits show leprechauns holding or working on shoes. And legend says that they are 
excellent cobblers making shoes for many different fairy communities. They are considered the only fairy to have a trade, and it's believed that they have this trade because fairies dance so much that they are always in need of shoes. Whether or not the leprechauns themselves dance is one of those debated issues. Some say no, and thus the general grumpiness. Some say leprechauns not only dance, but they sing and play instruments. So again, this part of the lore is tied to where you think the leprechauns came from and what you think they are. The famous Irish writer and poet Yeats is quoted as saying, because of their love of dancing, they, the fae, will constantly need shoes. Yeats goes on to tell the story of a woman who had been spirited away by the fairies. She returned seven years later, minus her toes. She had danced them off. So if you do believe leprechauns are fairies, then you agree with the part of the lore that says the leprechaun is well known for his love of Irish music and traditional dance. They often hold celebrations that can last for days and are expert musicians when it comes to playing the tin whistle, the fiddle, Bodron, and even the Irish harp. In one story, there was a human fiddler who took a shortcut home. He passed by a mound and saw the fairies dancing. They asked him to come and play for them, filling his pockets with gold and his mouth with liquor. So he played and he played while they danced and danced. And when his pockets were full and he was sufficiently drunk, he went home. When he arrived, a man younger and much more handsome greeted him at the door. He informed our dear fiddler that he'd been missing for two years. The younger, and for the purpose of this story, the better man had married the fiddler's wife. Devastated, the fiddler checked his pockets because at least he still had his gold. Sadly, his pockets were full of nothing but horse manure. Morals, people, if you get drunk and leave your wife, she is going to upgrade and no one is going to believe your fairy story unless you come home with actual gold. Another part of this lore that blew my mind because I had never heard this before in relation to leprechauns, but this says that if you are lucky enough to catch a leprechaun, he will grant you three wishes. So leprechauns are not only fairies, gods, angels, and maybe tulpas, they are also genies. As with genies, you must be careful when making your wishes with the leprechaun because one wrong wish and you're done. Bad luck for the rest of your life. Now, this wish granting part of the lore comes from a story that reminds me of Gulliver's travels to Lilliput. Lilliput is one of two fictional island nations that appear in the first part of the 1726 novel Gulliver's Travels by Jonathan Swift. The two islands are neighbors in the South Indian Ocean, separated by a channel 800 yards or 730 meters wide. Both are inhabited by tiny people who are about one twelfth the height of normal human beings. Again, what is considered normal? As this abbreviated leprechaun wish-granting lore goes, there was a king asleep on a shoreline. He woke to find himself being carried into the surf by a bunch of wee people. They were apparently going to drown him. He captured them and forced them to grant him three wishes because I guess it's universally known that we people are magic. I mean, didn't this king react how all of us would have? You're bigger than them, so why run away? Just scoop them up, squeeze them to within an inch of their life, and demand wishes. Yep, I'm rolling my eyes right along with you. So now this brings us to conclusion time. What do I personally think about leprechauns? First of all, Ireland, St. Patrick is not your friend. He was stolen from his country, sold into slavery, and sent to Ireland where he claimed to have fallen in love with people. 
when he was freed, he wanted nothing more than to go back to his so-called beloved Ireland so he could save them. Well, if you believe any of the lore, St. Patrick is responsible for there being no snakes in Ireland. He ran them all off. Why would he do such a thing? Well, just like it is universally known that we folk grant wishes, it is also known that snakes are the natural predators of the leprechaun. St. Patrick ran off the predator of the leprechaun, and now you can't even have a baby in Ireland without sacrificing them to their father's clothing. The country is infested with leprechauns and all because of good old St. Patrick. I'd also like to pause here and insert an actual fact for you. I have green eyes. Therefore, I am unpinchable. Just putting that out there in case anyone gets any ideas this St. Patrick's Day, pinching me is like rubbing a leprechaun the wrong way. A lifetime of bad luck. Leprechaun conclusion part two. In the Paracas region of Peru, archaeologists found remains of ancient civilizations. These remains have elongated skulls. Now, on every single continent, there have been skulls found with this cranial deformity, one intentionally caused by the humans in the cultures around the globe and usually to mark the ruling class. So the rulers, the royalty, the aristocracy were easily identified upon sight by the shape of their head. As time has gone on and more excavations and research has happened in Peru, it's said that these elongated skulls found in this particular location belonged to a ruling class of people reported to have fair skin and red hair. They were tall and came from afar, sailing into the area on great ships, conquering and ruling until they were ultimately defeated once again. I say once again because I think we all know where I'm going with this. The leprechauns who didn't want to live underground and shrink because they know out of sight, out of mind, people are going to stop believing in them. Those leprechauns set sail on their burnt out metal ships and followed yet another bird straight to Peru. Furthermore, it's said that the reason ancient people deformed their heads to mark the ruling class was because the rulers wanted to mimic what they saw in their gods. And this, ladies and gentlemen, brings us right back around full circle to where we never started, aliens. The place where all roads lead. Beings visited Earth were maybe rightly called gods, but the people here on Earth with the power mimicked these beings because they wanted to be able to keep said power over the normal-sized humans with their normal-shaped heads. Wars were fought, people conquered, babies snatched, tall and short tales told, and here we are today still talking about it and still being visited by UFOs and all the other new cool objects that the U.S. government is now admitting exists. Before I go, I want to let Ireland know that you are not alone in your plight. In the States, we have something called the Tommy Knockers. They're basically leprechauns who live in mines and caves, so they would be around two to three foot tall. The reason they haven't gotten their own holiday is simply because our population is under control because we have snakes. Therefore, we blew up St. Patrick's Day, made it all about leprechauns, collaring shamrocks, and every drink in the universe green just to taunt our Tommy knockers. If they leave the caves, they know we're going to send in the snakes. So send postage and maybe we can arrange to get you, Ireland, a few copperheads of your own. Just kidding, lest anyone believes anything I have said today. And that is it, folks. Thank you for joining me on today's episode of Immortal Monsters. I hope it made you smile and I will even take all of those eye rolls. 
please subscribe on whatever platform you happen to be listening on, rate and review the show, follow me on social media. If you feel like it, I don't post a lot, but it's there if you want to take a look. My website is leadonabooks.com. I do have an Immortal Monsters tab and things will grow there over time. I also have a Patreon, which will give you a shout out on the show, access to all of my eBooks and audiobooks, bonus podcast content, and early access to regular podcast episodes. I'd love to hear from you. Let me know what topics you're interested in. And if you've experienced hauntings, cryptid encounters, trips to parallel universes, doors in the forest, or any other bizarre thing under the sun, feel free to write in and tell me about it. My email is leadonabooks at gmail.com. Until next time, be kind and don't squeeze the leprechauns. Immortal monsters.